objects or ends should be unconditionally good, and then defining morality as promoting those ends. Instead, what we need to do is start with what a good will is, what a good will would do, and then derive from that an account of what ends are worth pursuing, because they would be pursued by a good will. So we need some way of saying what makes a will a good one without first knowing what it's aiming at. So we need to know something about what makes a maximum good. So let me say this again. All actions, including moral actions, attempt to achieve some goal or other. Whenever we will, we will an end. But the point here is that the worth of these goal-directed activities, the worth of these acts of willing, does not come from simply aiming at the right goals, but somehow from the principle on which it's, uh, the action is based. So the thought here now is that if we cannot identify what makes a maxim a good one based simply on it aiming for the right <coughs> Let's say that all that's left, he says, to the idea of acting on a proper maxim is the idea of acting from duty as opposed to acting in pursuit of some some specific goal that we can identify. But this is mysterious. What could this idea mean? What could it mean to act on the formal idea of duty alone? Top of 17. So just right at 402. It says, but what kind of law can that possibly be? The representation of which, even without regard for the effect expected from it, must determine the will for it to be called good absolutely and without limitation. So, what can we say about these maxims? Not that they're aiming at the right thing. Well, he says, nothing remains but as such the universal conformity of actions with law, which alone is to serve the will as its principle. That is, I ought never to proceed except in such a way that I could also will that my maxim should become a universal law. So somehow nothing remains but the simple idea of universal conformity of action with law. And this is it. This is for Kant the supreme principle of morality. This is the standard for determining whether maxims are good. And so the standard, therefore, for determining whether a person is a will is and so the standard basis ultimately for determining which ends are good. So later on they'll call this, this, this standard the categorical imperative. And this is the first place that we've seen it. We'll talk about it much more coming up uh, soon. And uh, I want you to remember that Kant is coming to this idea of the supreme principle of morality from the point of view of common sense and moral understanding a common sense understanding of what makes things valuable, what makes things unconditionally valuable, and the idea of duty. Now, I have to admit to you that the first time, the first times I read this, uh, starting when I was an undergraduate, I had simply no idea where this idea of universal law was coming from. Uh, it looks like he's pulling it out of the but I think all of the resources really are there in place. He doesn't explain this clearly, um, but I do think the resources are there to understand it better. And that's why I've been going so slowly to make sure we have all these things. Okay, so Kant's idea is this. A good will is supposed to be the condition that makes contingent values, contingent ends, actually objectively so lots of things can be good under 
one circumstance or another, but the condition which makes them objectively good is that they are either willed directly by a good will or they make some kind of instrumental contribution to the end that is willed by a good will. Everybody okay so far? And the good will is good because of its maxim, because of its principle of action. So we need to think about when a maxim is a good one. We need some way, some principle of determining what makes a maxim rational and reasonable for a person to adopt. We need some way of picking out the good maxims. And there's not much to work with here, as we saw. Right? So we need some kind of standard for picking out maxims. So suppose I think that a maxim is a good one when it has properties P1, P2, and P3. Who the heck knows what these are? But imagine we agree that maxims are good ones when they have properties P1, P2, and P3. Just leave those blank for a moment. OK, so these are the things that I don't care what they are right um, as long as they don't involve moral language, right? If, they, if we say that a maxim is a good one when it's what duty requires, that's going to be trivial. Okay, so we have to have some kind of non-trivial, some, some kind of characterization of the maxims that doesn't presuppose we know which maxims are good. So supposing, good. So suppose we know that P1, what P1, P2, those are the ones that make the maxims good, so that when a will acts on the basis of those maxims, it's a good one. And that means that if a person acts on a maxim that has property one, property two, property three, that's a good will. And by willing on the basis of a good maxim, that means that the condition for certain things being good is satisfied because we have a good will now. So a good will is the condition that makes ends good. Is that clear? Okay. So when a maxim has these properties, and it's a good one, that means that a will person acting on that maxim makes the end objectively good, okay? Because that's the condition for conditional goods being good. So, so take a maxim with those properties. When somebody acts on that maxim, that end that the maxim specifies in those circumstances when acted on for that reason <coughs> is good. <coughs> This means if it's a good maxim, it has these properties, then when somebody acts on it, the end that they're pursuing is in fact, the end that they're pursuing, when they're pursuing it in those circumstances for that reason, when they're actually acting on the maxim, then that end is, is good, objectively good. Yes? All right? Okay. But if the end is objectively good, then that means that that maxim also has another property. That other property is that it's possible for everyone to act on that maxim. It's possible for everyone to act on that maxim because by acting on that maxim, the end is objectively good. Not just good for me, not just good for you, but really good really and truly good. So it has to be possible for everyone to recognize that objective end, sorry, that that end is objectively good, and it has to be possible for them to be able to, in those circumstances, pursue that objective good for the right reason specified by that maxim. Because it's supposed to be objective. So, is that all right? So, if a 
maxim has property P1, P2, and P3 that makes it a good maxim, that makes the end objectively good when you will for the right reason, based on that maxim, then that maxim will also have property U. That maxim will also have property U, namely universalizability, the fact that everybody could act on it. Because it makes ends objectively valuable. Objectively good. Objectively good for everyone, so to speak. Okay? So no matter what you tell me properties P1, P2, and P3 are that makes the maxim good, I'm going to tell you those maxims also have this property here. That those maxims could be universalized.